I'm Carla Coppell, and I am Vice President here with uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace. And I always am happy when it is a Columbia Peace Forum because we get musical accompaniment, which is a rare occurrence for our meetings. Um, as I think most of you know, but I will say, the U.S. Institute of Peace was created through an act of Congress uh, during the period of President Reagan and is committed to the proposition that peace is possible, practical, and cost-effective. We work globally both with field programs on the ground and an extensive program of global research to look for uh, the most effective strategies to prevent, resolve, and rebuild following, following conflict. And it's wonderful to be collaborating with the Washington Office on Latin America and the Latin American Working Group uh, in putting together this extraordinary program this morning. Um, as I mentioned, it's ooh, it's very loud. You can stand back here. Um, part of the Columbia Peace Forum, which was started by our dear colleague Ginny Bouvier in 2012, uh, to really track progress with the peace process and to um, discuss uh, challenges with implementation, negotiation, and the carry forward. Of course, in that period since 2012, a lot has changed. Uh, and so today we're here to talk about uh, implementation of, of an accord um, in its early stages of implementation, I should say. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Jimena Sanchez and Lisa Haugard for joining us today and putting on the presentation. It's great to have you both here um, for this discussion. Uh, and I'm particularly honored to uh, be introducing a panel with the 2017 winners of the Columbia National Prize for the Defense of Human Rights. Uh, so congratulations, and it's our honor to host all of you here this morning. Um, the prize itself is sponsored by Diakonia, a Swedish uh, humanitarian agency, uh, and it's wonderful that they've brought uh, the winners here um, to be with us this morning. Uh, they're here spending a week in Washington, D.C., talking about both their work, uh, this incredible mask, uh, which I hope you guys will talk about a little bit because it's amazing and beautiful, um, and uh, the path forward. Um, and I should say that for the U.S. Institute of Peace, it's particularly timely to have the conversation today because just yesterday we hosted the European Union uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Stavros Lambrinidis. And uh, in his discussion, um, he really talked about uh, the importance of civil society organizations in uh, sustaining and maintaining peace. And so this is an incredibly perfect uh, follow-on to that general conversation about the work that he's doing around the world. Uh, and so I'm excited to um, hear some of that conversation. Uh, last but not least, thank you to Steve Hege and Tonis Montes for putting together the program and for moderating. Um, Steve is a senior program officer here uh, with the Institute and in, uh, Moonlights on Columbia. Uh, so thank you for that. And Tonus has been a stalwart supporter of our Columbia program for years. So um, thanks again for putting this together. And I look forward to listening to this incredibly rich conversation. Thank you very much, Carla. Good morning to everyone. Um, you all have, uh, I believe, uh, headsets. We're going to have the most of the conversation this morning in Spanish. And I will begin um, in that regard. So, muchísimas gracias, Carla. Por Thank you very much, Carla, for your warm introduction. Good morning to everyone uh, that's here with us this morning. On behalf of the United States Institute for Peace, it is uh, very. We are very grateful to host this peace forum on Colombia along with our partners from WOLA and LOG. We are taking this opportunity to share the inspira ins inspirational examples of the winners of the Daconia Human Rights Award in Colombia who are here with us today and who we are receiving very warmly and, ex and with much excitement, understanding that Colombia is passing through a very important time with a lot of uncertainty but also understanding that there's a lot of resilience and hope. The continuation of the forums for peace in Colombia is very important for all of us who knew Ginny Bouvier, our dear colleague who unfortunately left us last year. 
these forums constitute a tangible example of Ginny's legacy and an example of how her work keeps leaving uh, the footprint of peace and changing the conditions of people, of all of the folks affected by the armed conflict in Colombia. Over her long career, Ginny, as a peace builder, Colombian human rights uh, were very important to her. Just like all of us today, Ginny would be very honored to have Enrique, Angelica, Ivan, and Doña Socorro here with us today. As moderator this morning, I don't intend to replace Ginny in this space, but what I will do is to attempt to humbly moderate this exchange of experiences and hopes of our four guests of honor to ensure that Lisa and Jimena have the opportunity to formulate questions and highlight the most relevant aspects. Over many decades, being a human rights defender in Colombia has been a critical vocation uh, that has also been very dangerous. Monitoring, documenting, uh, denouncing grave human rights violations such as murders, disappearances, threats, arbitrary detentions, massive displacements and forced recruitment is an essential labor to, for safeguarding human rights at any country at war. Communities and individuals, regardless of political tendency, who suffer from these acts depend on these human rights defenders to ensure that their pain not remain in the shadows and in forget, and, and so that their institutions can have adequate responses to restore their dignity vis-a-vis -vis their uh, the, the vocation of being a human rights worker is what's important is to commit oneself to protecting others. Many times human rights defenders can attract the anger of perpetrators and can become themselves uh, victims. In spite of the fact that since the beginning of the implementation of the peace accord signed between the Colombian government and the FARC, there have been undoubtable improvements in security in certain parts of the country. Threats and selective assassinations of leaders, community leaders, as well as ex-combatants, have not halted. In fact, they have increased. In Colombia, there are many statistics, but the ones I would like to share with you come from the Institute for uh, the Development of pa Peace, INDEPAS, that just published alarming figures about the 170 social leaders and human rights defenders killed in 2017, which represents an increase of 45% in comparison to the previous year. The departments of Cauca, Nariño, Antioquia, Valle del Cauca, and Chocó have been the most heavily hit. Those areas in which FARC guerrillas held Territorial control are those areas affected by new armed actors and organized criminal groups. Neither the prosecutor general nor the government have not been able to uh, systematize these assassinations. Unfortunately, this has become uh, attributed to isolated cases. All of this added to the long history of underappreciating and stigmatizing victims in Colombia. Also, with the objective of minimizing risks, the government has undertaken certain efforts to attend to this situation. First, the National Unit of Protection has incorporated new members of to their teams from uh, FARC ranks by means of Decree 2124 of 2017, there was a new way to respond to early alerts established, which uh, equally, in December of last year, the Ministry of Defense started a new security strategy which included de deploying many members of the public f uh, force to affected municipalities. 
In January of 2018, the investigators from Indepas have reported 21 more cases of murders of human rights defenders and social leaders. Furthermore, the expiration on January 9th of the temporary bilateral ceasefire with the ELN guerrillas has brought forth a new wave of violence that includes urban attacks such as the attack in Barranquilla on the 27th of January. Regarding the situation of security for former FARC combatants, last week the Prosecutor General recognized that in these rural areas that the FARC have been concentrated to lay down weapons, there have been FARC members and family members uh, murdered, including members of the new FARC political party, at least 50 of these people. Also, members of the Centro Democrático party have denounced situations of threats against uh, candidates in the electoral period. And I will ask Enrique, Angelica, Ivan, and Doña Socorro to please enrich with their perspectives uh, all of this information, both as human rights defenders and as the spokespersons for people who are vulnerable to these types of attacks, as well as from a more personal level, as subjects who run the same risks as the people they defend. I would also like for them to understand the causes of violence in, at, in this historical moment that brings together the, the post-agreement with the FARC and the electoral campaign for Congress scheduled for March 11th. I would also like to take advantage of this space so that our guests can share with us their analyses from a human rights perspective on various fundamental aspects of the current situation in Colombia, such as the achievements and difficulties of implementing the FARC agreement, the work of the Special Jurisdictions for Peace, and the Truth Commission, which were recently established, the challenges of humanitarian protection in conflict zones after following the breaking of the ceasefire between the ELN and the government and the implications of large migratory waves of Venezuelans towards Colombia. After Enrique, Angelica, Ivan, and Doña Socorro speak, I will invite our two commentators to ask some questions to enrich our conversation with their perspectives. Both are very well known by many of you in this audience. We have Jimena Sanchez with us, the director of for the Andes of for WOLA, who has fought for many years to highlight the reality of the millions of displaced persons in Colombia and to recognize the rights of Afro Colombian and indigenous communities. I would also like to introduce Lisa Haugard, the dir executive director of the Latin American Working Group. For two decades, she has led the promotion of human rights and peace issues in Latin America, coordinating coalition campaigns, uh, giving testimony various times to Congress, and producing a wide variety of written works on human rights in Latin America. I had the great privilege of serving with both of them as a member of the jury of the Diaconia Human Rights Prize, and I'm sure they would be in agreement with me when I say that it was not a simple task, given that we had dozens of candidates who were more than deserving of this prize or these prizes. I would like to invite Cesar from Diaconia before uh, presenting or introducing our award winners so that Cesar can say a few words on the origin and purpose of these human rights awards. Good morning. As Steve just said a moment ago, human rights defenders in Colombia face many aggressions and situations that put their work and lives at risk. 
but there is one type of aggression that has been going on for years that's especially significant, and that has to do with the de the social and political delegitimization of defenders. These defenders have been accused of many things. They've been accused of being anti-patriotic. They've been accused of being human rights traffickers who carry out politics with human rights, who are opposed to everything and have very few proposals. They're always bothering. They're always fingering the wound and have very few ideas and proposals. They've been called allies of the insurgency who try to trick public opinion. This is what they say when they're not saying even more insulting things about them. Within this context of social and political delegitimization, we created the National Prize for Human Rights in 2012 as an effort so that Colombian society can begin to think that these men and women that are here with us, the prize winners, that they make part of the solution to our problems. They're not an additional problem. And they can contribute to building peace. In fact, they've been building peace for years. And with their support, Colombian democracy can improve. The National Prize for the Defense of Human Rights in Colombia is granted by Diaconia and the Church of Sweden. We have a delegate of the Church of Sweden here with us, and it's a pleasure uh, for that they make part for us that they make part of this alliance. I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to also express uh, our. Uh, uh, we would like to honor Ms. Ginny for her commitment to human rights in Colombia. To thank USIP for their warm welcome today, their solidarity with human rights defenders, and to. Uh, thank Log and Wola for their work and their support over the years to these causes and their work preparing the agenda for the prize winners. And I would just like to finish by saying that the protagonists of this meeting are the colleagues we our colleagues we have here on the stage. There were 75 individuals and organizations nominated to this prize, and there was an independent jury made up of the Econia members and the Church of Sweden, and the jury decided that these are the people that should be honored. And they can explain their work in favor of human rights and peace much better than I can. Thank you very much for your presence this morning. Without more delay, it's my honor to introduce the four winners of the National Human Rights Prize. Granted by Diaconia in Colombia, we will begin by age, beginning with the winner in the category of recognizing a whole lifetime of work. And this is Mrs. Socorro Aceros Bautista. You all have some words about Ms. Socorro's life written down on paper. There are some biographies of each prize winner in the hall before you enter the conference room. But I will briefly read some important aspects of Ms. Socorro's life. Throughout her lifetime, Ms. Socorro has dedicated decades of her life accompanying victims of paramilitaries in the Tame uh, Arauca Department. She was instrumental in the creation of the Association of Agricultural Producers and Marketers of Flor Amarillo, where she was also the coordinator of the Health Committee of the Community Action Board of the Tame Municipality. Ms. Socorro was displaced following her son's murder. Since the 1980s, armed groups have persecuted and targeted her due to her work. She participates in numerous justice and peace in initiatives, and this has motivated victims to not remain silent and to continue their search for missing relatives. 
Ms. Socorro also accompanies the processes led by the indigenous people living on the banks of the Cravo River so that they can get ahead in terms of confronting their daily obstacles. I will give the floor to Ms. Socorro. It's a huge honor to have you here with us today so that you can uh, tell us about your point of view regarding the historical moment that Colombia is living. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. I, my name is Socorro Acero Bautista. I'm from the uh, Arauca Department in Colombia, in the Tame Municipality. I was the winner for uh, a, a lifetime of um, defensive work. Thank you to um, Diaconia and the Swedish Church that gave me this prize for a lifetime of work. I am, excuse me, because I am a regional leader I w didn't have any s schooling, just uh, f up to third grade in a, a in an elementary school. But what I did learn was to fight, to fight for all human beings. When I was about eleven years old, I had to be in charge of my family, my mother, and my. I had to be mother, mother, and my father because my mother had blood cancer and my father had tropical anemia. Uh, so when I started working, people started to meet me and to know me, and I was a very busy person. And when I want, and I wanted to learn a lot of things, and thanks to God, I was able to um, become a, a med in a medical brigade. I participated in them. My uh, my grandmother was a midwife, and she taught me when when I was 13 years old. She at, when I was 13 years old, she taught me how to cut the umbilical cord. You know what that is, right? Well, so from there, I turned into a midwife just along with my grandmother. Her name was Julia Rondon. And she, afterwards, people started to know that I was a midwife. And she wanted to take me to a hospital, so... I could be start working there and I could learn earn my livelihood from mother and from my father and from my two younger brothers that we had, but they didn't accept me there because I didn't have enough studies. And there was a gentleman who was a friend of ours, I was then 18 years old, and he told us to come to the Arauca department because that's where oil was and there was money there. And I've always been a lover of money all my life, but earning it in an honorable fashion. I thought there I would get a job, even doing whatever, but nothing. I couldn't, there was nothing. So I started doing the work that I had as a midwife. And as I had some knowledge, and I have knowledge about how to do healing, because I was already trained to do uh, a th third degree um, tra trauma level in terms of cutting, curing tendons and veins. That was my knowledge. And so when uh, people had problems, they came up to us and they gave me money. Also, when people came who had molar problems or teeth problems, and the people and they wouldn't take out their molars, and they would they would say they didn't have anything to do with it. And one day a gentleman who had a m bad molar problem said, Socorro, why don't we do something? And I said, why don't we uh, sterilize a, a plier, um, one of those ones that you take out screws, and just want you to take out my molar. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. And he was... And, but he said, you know, you have practice, because I was a friend of the of doctors, and they had showed me this, and so that's how I pulled out my first molar, and I became um, uh, a midwife, nurse, uh, and a dentist. <laughs> so, in this work, I finished this work in 2004, when the wave of paramilitaries came, which started in 1999, in Tame. And then went up and up to 2004. They came there and they finished everything off for us. They killed my son. They threatened me. I finished here. Now I'm protected here because I'm all I'm with you here. Thank God, and I have it all. But at that time, I had nothing. I had to leave. 
I had to hide. I had to leave Arauca towards Cucuta. I don't know how. It was in one of those uh, uh, in one of those covered trucks. Uh, they call them Termojina in Colombia. And there I was able to get my other children out, and we went to Cucuta, and then to Bucaramanga in the Santander department, because I am a Santanderiana. And there I started to sell empanadas, potatoes, um, co coffee uh, with milk, but I was not able to cover the rent. We would, we would wake up at 3 in the morning to have the food ready to sell. And my son... Um, was he would sell the papas, the empanadas, and the milk with coffee, and I sold under underwear. But what happened? It was not a lot of sales I could do. So one of my granddaughters said, "Grandma, why don't we go to the warehouses and we let's get some fabric, so they can which can be used for blankets, and we'll sell them." And it was. Oh, they were not blankets, but rather for mosquito nets. And but I realized I just had my my two daughters also. They come over here because there are people who are um, displaced. They're victims, and the uh, the people are asking them to put um, denounce to put denunciations. But I had. I was I was going to I went back to Tame and, and I went I went back like the mouse trying to hide from the cat going from corner to corner because I'd been threatened they had I had pursued me and they had gotten me out of there. And so then we started to work with the investigators with the um, investigating prosecutors and I took 200 or more uh did not, complaints from people for who out of fear, they didn't leave, but I, even with my fear, I left, and I went out. And that's when we founded an association called Prosperar, and they named me as the leader t for the air, the Flor Amarillo area. And they came to, I went looking at all the displaced people, victims, and I started looking down. T I told them we should all sort start an association. So we started this association, and as the government always tells you, well, for victims, there will be money, there will be, I don't know what, we're going to give them money, we're going to give them reparations. I also said that, to the same thing to people. That's right. So the association was uh, formed with 180 members, 160 members, but as there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any money, just work. And so people started to to leave. And so at the end, we just had, yeah, 168. And the end we were helped with a project where we had two refrigerators and just a table to work on and a water tank and a, a motorcycle uh, um, to carry food. And I was always, at every meeting I would say, help us with something. Look, we're on unprotected people. But you're always thinking that there's people who don't like that you working for victims you don't know at one time they'll come and they'll tell you sh and they'll shoot you. You don't know about you don't know what will happen. The paramilitaries are always threatening us. They said they're going to finish they're going to finish off all the leaders and excuse the my bad words, but they said they're going to kill off all the informants um who open their the shithole informants and saying that we're going to um that we have to stop complaining to the government. So that's where we are. Thank goodness. If I've forgotten a few things, excuse me, I don't know. Uh, thanks to God and for the people who paid attention to me, and i asking for help so that you work with us, so that our only uh, TPS has helped us, uh, but we, don't, we have been only to do by ourselves, everything else, everything that else coming, the region's very rich, is, uh, plantains, rice, uh, corn, uh, fish, eggs, everything. We have all that. But there we are. Because if we don't have any help from the governments to buy some land and to make a house, we're in bad in a, in a bad straits because it's we have a lot of work to do. Well, thank you. I think appreciate uh, Diakonia and the Swedish Church and Wola who are the ones who have invited us here. 
and with here to our, my gentle, this gentleman here, and to all of you who are present here, thank you, and excuse me for anything that I might have tripped up on. Thank you very much, Ms. Socorro, for that uh, life testimony. It makes total sense that you have won this recognition for a lifetime of of work for all your life of sacrifice and perseverance, and not just for your family in your case, but for the case of all members of your community facing those threats and those dangers and learning so much wisdom at the same time. At some, one point, I'm going to ask you to help me with one of my teeth that I have here hurting me. Uh, maybe you can help me with that. Uh, I will, yes, sir. Okay, so now we're going to go on to our next winner, our human rights winner for the Defender of the Year. We have the privilege to invite in Enrique Chimonja Coy, who is the member of the Inter-Ecclesiastical Commission for Justice and Peace. He is a human rights defender based in Buenaventura, Valle del Cauca. In 2015, his organization, uh, the Inter-Ecclesial Inter Commission for Justice and Peace, CIJP, was awarded WOLA's Human Rights Award for its unwavering commitment to justice in the face of intimidation and violence. Um, among his other acti um, their other activities, CIJP provides key accompaniment and legal representation for displaced victims and civilian communities living in areas of armed conflict. Enrique has helped civilians create the humanitarian space in Puente Nayero, an area in Buenaventura where that civilians designated free of armed groups and violence in 2014. CIJP played a leading role in advocating for the recommendations of victims would, and that they be integrated into the peace accords with the FARC. And in this, they're doing the same with the ELN process. Thank you very much, Enrique, for being here with us this morning. And I'll pass the microphone to you. Good morning to everyone. To kind of continue with, um, with our doctor and matriarch, um, Socorro Acero, was saying, I don't know if Carlos mentioned it, but she, of the of the thirteen years when she was thirteen years old, she she's since thirteen she's cut more than two thousand, three thousand umbilical cords and more than three thousand births, and and that was the most sacred act that you can do, which is to help to bring life in or uh, bring life into this world. In, in that way, I think, with all of you, from your different places that you come from in the world, we are trying to accompany or we're able to accompany perhaps the most painful birth and which is understanding what our mothers tell us about birth which is the birth of a construction towards peace not just in Colombia but in all the world. Obviously, this birth, we're part of all of this. From the wisdom and experience of our matriarchs, our indigenous Afro-descendant and Campesino matriarchs, as well as each one of your contributions from wherever you may be. 
So first I would like to recognize each one of you because, well, I think that being here is an unwavering conviction that amongst all of us we can achieve the necessary reconciliation in Colombia. And to p put down the bases for a true peace and an inclusive peace with justice, with social justice, environmental justice, and gender justice. Obviously, we have come in here in a moment that is very hopeful as for Colombia as well as the world. And at the same time, it's very complex due to the current panorama. Stephen already mentioned it in the introduction. It's, it's been more than 20 leaders killed just in 2018. And we've put up here this orange color with the word no sin olvido. Do not forget to keep them present here. And we're putting up some names. Oh, and we hope that you hold them in your hearts. To remember in the case in in the case of Buenaventura, our great leader for the of the civil strike in 2017, Mr. Temocles Machado, who was assassinated because of Temistocles Machado who was killed for something that still has not been resolved and that's why the violence is continuing and this is the issue of territory uh, territorial interests and the non-recognition of the from the judiciary of who are the legitimate and real owners of the territory in Colombia. So when for Temistocles, we, along with him, we rem remember all the leaders in Colombia. In December, perhaps, in from our webpage, you know, and from our communiques, you may know about the very painful uh, method um, of Herman Bedoya in Chocoyo and of Mario Castaño. And these are the final last victims of a process of demanding restitution for the victims in the collective uh, territories of Higuamiando and Curvarado uh, on the border with Panama in the north of Choco. And with these murders, the resistance and that that ha has been from business um, and economic interests against the process, the peace process. And even after the FARC, even after the FARC has left down their arms, they are, uh, these interests are trying to push the Afro-descendants and campesinos off of their land. So this is an emblematic case in which, for which there's a lot of uh, documentation and we have had to go to the Inter-American Commission to protect these communities. And even the Constitutional Court in the, in the Colombian case has um, put forth seven writs uh, regarding this territory and their true owners, but still that uh, judicial order has not been fulfilled because the state is not a fact de, de, de facto state but it's a, a it's not a, a, it's a de facto state um in line with the narco paramilitaries who are in line with the business interests and we must rem remind remember within those leaders last year in Buenaventura a big a principal leader was killed um, part of the the Compass network in terms of Emilsa Manjoma, 
along with her husband. And they were taken out of their home, and after having been tortured, they were murdered in the same urban area. which where there is a lot of commercial and economic interests currently in Colombia due to its location on the Pacific Ocean and for being the main port in Colombia which is Buenaventura so so that orange color with the never forget is for the hundreds of thousands of people killed in Colombia people who have been disappeared in Colombia and the leaders in Colombia threatened for defending life and defending a territory. And the green color also with the never forget has to do with the hundreds of crimes against our common home as the Pope has said against the territory, against Mother Earth due to the intervention especially of agro-industry businesses, mining companies, or in the case of the Pacific, the uh, expansion of a port to comply with the free trade agreements that have been signed over the past decades. So there's an accumulation of harm, some irreparable that have been done to the territory, but others that can be recovered from. And what we need is for those responsible for these crimes against uh, human life and nature recur to one of the mechanisms that victims and human rights defenders have created and which has been one of the greatest advances in terms of the signing of the peace accord with the FARC, which is the special jurisdiction for peace, as well as the Truth Commission. We think this is part of the painful birth and uh, that those who are in power don't want to recognize. Today, we don't fear the judiciary. We don't feel, uh, we don't fear sentences to prison. We don't fear extradition for s to countries like the United States. The real fear in Colombia is the fear of the truth. Because that means really learning about and looking at ourselves and taking responsibility, and that goes much beyond people that have lifted up arms. The responsibility of guerrillas, of paramilitaries, and of the state is severe. But beyond that, we have people who have benefited from the violence in Colombia. Especially businesses and companies. So I would like for this to be a space where we can remind ourselves about the importance of the comprehensive system for truth, justice, and reparation and non-repetition uh, so that this truth commission not leave the doors open to impunity and so that uh, civilians and victims can not be left out of this mechanism. These are very emotional spaces. Where certain episodes 
are repeated episodes that have been very painful for us. Thirty-five years ago, my father was disappeared. And that's why point five of the agreement is so important for their and the unit f for searching for the search of disappeared persons has been created. a very important step because we have to restore this damage and have a dignified memory of these lives of these disappeared persons. We know that there are more than 70,000 in Colombia. Exactly 33 years ago, in 1985, in Colombia we were living through a very uh, a similar moment. It was the a peace process undertaken by President Belisario Betancourt's government. It was a hopeful moment. the Colombian people supported this process. And there was a political party that uh, uh, came about as a result of these agreements and negotiations. It was the Union Patriotica, or Patriotic Union Party. In my municipality, in the south of the Huila department, We had the first massacre perpetrated on October 11th, 1985 against this movement in this region in Colombia. And as you may well know, the figure of people assassinated or disappeared for having said yes to the to building peace as a political exercise, it's more than 6,000 people, victims that made part of the Patriotic Union political movement and who were murdered or disappeared. And today, it's been pain we've read a, a painful figure about ex combatants who make part of the new FARC political party who have been murdered following the laying down of arms and the signing of the peace agreement. This worries us all. We need to prevent that the genocide against the Patriotic Union not be repeated now just against the people that laid down their weapons, but also those who have for a long time been building real proposals for peace. We've heard Doña Socorro here talk about how the issue of building peace in Colombia doesn't start with conversations between the FARC and the national government. Peace proposals in Colombia have to do with historic struggles that have been going on for hundreds of years, carried out by the indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities who have been offering resolutions for 
ending the conflict and have made real proposals for creating uh, dignified living conditions without having to turn to armed violence. These are ancestral, peaceful proposals that deeply respect Mother Earth and the universe from which we receive life and which have also served as an inspiration to help resolve armed conflicts. So, as a Peace and Justice Commission, we've had the opportunity to accompany and support processes, especially in the Chocó Department on the Colombian Pacific Coast and now in Buenaventura, which have gathered together these ancestral practices and have been adjusted to international uh, law, especially international humanitarian law, to construct in rural areas and now recently in Buenaventura in urban areas proposals that really affirm humanitarian rights and make possible conditions where we can have a respect for life and permanence in these territories. Furthermore, right now they should be made visible and supported by the international community and especially the national government regarding these figures that I'm sure you've heard mentioned I'm referring to the humanitarian zones in rural Colombia and humanitarian spaces in urban areas These mechanisms, joined together with proposals regarding agricultural and environmental issues, education for peace, and building peace universities, which have all been proposed within the framework of having Magistrates of the Truth Commission go around Colombia to different parts so that this can be a first step towards this construction of an educational proposal in function of peace, as a function of peace and not capitalist interests. So there's a list of concrete initiatives that are being carried out in these different territories. One of these is in Buenaventura. Uh, we, I hope that all of you can visit. And then we can multiply these types of conversations to see how we can uh, inspire people to continue with peace building. Thank you very much, Enrique, for your words. They're very inspiring. And they have reminded us of the deep pain that you as victims have felt and experienced in your lives, but also how this has been inspirational in that you defend others. And also reminding us of one of the many causes of serious human rights violations which are economic interests at the territorial level and giving us an idea of some of the land initiatives that you have worked on from your inter-ecclesial commission in Choco and certain areas of Buenaventura. Thank you very much. We now, I will now give the word to Angelica Ortiz. She is the winner in the category of collective experience or process of the year, Angelica is representative of the Sutsuin Yeyu Wayu organization. Please correct me if I'm mispronouncing it. It's a uh, Wayu women's uh, organization. And the name is in the Wayu language. It was founded in 2006 as an alliance between local communities and Wayu organizations. 
in the Guajira Department. The objective of the organization is to increase visibility of human and ethnic rights abuses committed in the Guajira Department. Angelica represents this group whose mandate includes creating consciousness about the difficulties faced by victims vis-à-vis -vis the militarization of their territories. Thank you very much, Angelica. I will give you the floor. Good morning. My name is Angelica Ortiz. I make part of the women's YU Force movement. We won the prize granted by the Church of Sweden in Daconia, the National Human Rights Defense Award for 2017. I think that we will always be short on time to talk about all of the experiences and suffering we've had in Colombia. This initiative was founded in 2016 in the middle of a wave of paramilitary violence. At that time, Fuerza de Mujeres, why you published a book called From the Desert, which narrates the paramilitary incursion into Guajira. Talking about paramilitary demobilization, and at the time, the organization was facing threats. Women that made up the organization. Fuerza de Mujeres, why you has always been an alliance between communities and the women that serve as coordinators within the organization. And what we have done is to tell victims that you have rights, and we started counting the number of victims, which was approximately 247 victims at that time. Unfortunately, due to cultural issues, there are many victims that are not registered in by the YU because if you speak about a victim without her permission, in cultural terms, it's a serious offense. So we started to work and pamphlets started appearing saying those crazy women over there, we're going to kill them, we're going to disappear them. And there was a lot of harassment and persecution of women that made part of the organization. And there were displaced women. We also have women who are in exile. One woman in exile who dared to write and more deeply narrate how the paramilitary system was operating. She was a victim of paramilitary violence. 17 members of her family were killed. Right now, she is an exile in Switzerland as another Colombian immigrant. She seems to be like an, any other immigrant because she has she has n not followed the laws where if one is in exile, you have to leave, has to leave the country in exile. Carmen Ramirez. And I just want to comment on what Enrique was saying. And as indigenous people, we always talk about how the first in our ethnic terrorists, we always say that the first victim is always Mother Earth because all of the attacks and bloodshed in the territory, we see how it's almost like a payment to the territory for all the irreversible damage that's been done. So on the one hand, there's the ter indigenous territory saying no more, no more, because it's in the ethnic territories where we have s felt this wave of violence in Colombia. 
both indigenous and African Colombian and peasant communities have had to suffer through displacements, disappearances, and murders of community members. This is also to say that although in Colombia, President Santos said that we're going to do the referend referendum, referendum through a plebiscite, and well, you all know what happened with that plebiscite, but the so civil society was um, wanting these uh, peace accords to be signed. So one day after the loss of this plebiscite, this referendum, the civil, civil society went out to all the main plazas in Colombia to say yes to peace. Not everything is going well. One thing were the peace accords with the FARC, and the other thing were the big uh, main deficiencies that the Santos government had and um, one was also the generation of hate coming from other sectors. Sadly, the gov Santos government never um, really stepped up to these uh, peace accords. There was uh, misunderstandings from outside that in order to put end to the FARC as a groomed arm, that putting an end to the FARC as a grouped armed group would end the violence. But as we see, the violence is increasing. There is a murders of social leaders and that, but there's also threats and um, displacement. So we also see how the National Army is doing an a is attacking an indigenous community in Choco and then later it says, I'm sorry, we, we thought there was an ELN troops. These type of things cannot continue happening. I think that we have suffered the worst part of the war in our territories and now we see how the we see the results of that referendum that we those of us who are victims of the war said yes to an end to the conflict and so although there has not everything is good in Colombia and and though some and though some of the attacks or the attacks of the FARC against the pipelines and the um, National Army, that is a hopeful thing. That is good, that's true. We're very slow in the implementation still. We're going at a turtle's pace. But the fact that these guns have been silenced and these weapons have been silenced, this is something that is hopeful. I think from the indigenous movement and from the very s same women, we are the big peace builders. The fact that we just alone generate life, that is a, p a symbol, that is a sign of peace, an act of peace. So I think the alliances that we have started to do um, as the women's um, force, why you force, we have started to um, forge uh, Caribbean Women's Indigenous Network to visibilize all these problems which though we have it in the though they are happening in our territories are not known. Sadly we also have an internal indigenous system which is unknown to us and this is And in the meetings, the last thing that talks about in our indigenous meetings is about women. And when they talk about it, the majority of people have left or people are tired and want to leave. So this is how, unfortunately, it is. If society in general is discriminating against women, in terms of earning the same salary that a uh, that a man would if that happens uh, among women who most know their rights and uh, among a society that most knows their ed rights and are educated among indigenous women the situation is even more even worse we don't know our rights and that's why the why you uh, women's movement has been a trying to push forth other forms of being and uh, women's wisdom. Ooh. 
every when we have cooperation uh, well obviously the government has to come and help but when there are convenings right the, a lot of the small organizations are forgotten and they only think about um, the bigger organizations while those of us who are suffering the threats are living in the territory that doesn't mean that these alliances are not productive or not have or have not been productive we in our territory have uh, work with Cajar, Concinet, and national organizations who have helped us and supported us in our territory. Just like we have the permanent, uh, the uh, Witness for Peace that does work in the territory, they're making visits to see how the situation is in our territory, and we've been working with them um, and showing us how we've been affected by mining. Also, uh, auto mining from London they are um, making um, British citizens aware of their responsibility um, and being tied to the Cerrejón because uh, Cerrejón is, um, has their base in London and in this way we have also worked with Witness for Peace for t doing alliances in our territory and where there's constant um, monitoring of what's happening in our territory. Um, Threats? Well, we are working closely with several social leaders who are part of the women's uh, YU movement, but they are uh, re threats, they are targets of repeated threats. Um, when we go to put the complaints to the governmental authorities, or to extend or to views, diffuse these, we we can't do it anymore. There's a government that does not respond to these threats. And we see, for example, in the case of YU Women's Movement, it's born in the middle of threats. It's been born in the middle of threats. And there has been a lack of attention uh, in terms of, pro lacks of attention in terms of protection of what's happening in YU territories. Right now, the Interior Ministry um, has given us a project. We did a project of uh, well, we went to a meeting with them, and it was very difficult, this relationship in the beginning. And right now, the um, YU women's movement f is unprotected, um, f uh, does not get protection from the state. Last year, there was a, a judgment against a par paramilitary under the... Uh, f under the who was covered under the justice and peace law and recognized all the damage uh, caused to our organization even uh, in this way the government has has been un unable to give us protection from the national pro uh, national protection unit in december we uh, after sometime since 2012, we got in touch with the National Protection Unit and they told us that uh, they said they were coming, they were coming three or four times. After three or four months, the result is nothing. They, we just want them to come to the territory to see if what is happening or not. There is another issue of environmental issues in the territory and the the rerouting of our water source people who don't know the guajira our territory is semi desertic semi -desert, desert it's a little bit arid on the border with venezuela and the few sources of water that we have which are of good quality it's not drinkable but it's semi sweet because the wa water is always a little bit salty Sadly, mining, because of the Cerrejón Corporation mines, um, has da damaged our water sources. In 2014 and 15, in those two years, we did a study of our different water sources that were disappearing and how many are being contaminated currently. It was a study with Indepaz, to talking about the contam water contamination and to examine the water that we have in three municipalities in our territory. 
and along with the, a university in Cartagena and a university in Germany. We want to continue doing this monitoring, but the things in our territory are not so good in terms of air quality. Every day at midday, there are vibrations as if it was an earthquake every day, and that's the, from the dynamite that they put underground to get the coal out. This coal that produces energy in a large part of Europe. On the other hand, we have a, a presence in the territory of the ELN. We are also hoping that the, there is a ceasefire and that the conversations continue between the government and the ELN. Colombia deserves to live better. And I think something that I saw on social media these days when we were there was an armed lockdown by the ELN um, with burges b blown up and cars burned and everything else. But we see the double standard of Colombians. We see that they complain about about the about war, but then they also complain about peace. So that's where my question is. For these people who complain about both things, what is your proposal to get out of this impasse that we're in in Colombia? If we complain about the good things, but then we also complain about the bad things. This is a challenge to try to get the ELN to sign a ceasefire we are in a very difficult stage in Colombia right now because we are in pre-elections in the campaign campaign time, and so we've seen how hate messages have increased um, and been spread through social media. In an open campaign from the right-wing media who manipulate media in the country, and they're manip they're sending these messages against progressive candidates from the Green Party or from the leftist parties, and we see how they are attacking them in the interviews that they do, in a very, a very disrespectful way. These this hate has been um, spread out through social media, and the people are um, s tweeting them out without actually informing themselves. And one journalist was saying that in Colombia, people just dedicate themselves to sending things out, but they don't have a critical analysis of what they're reading. They just uh, dedicate themselves to sending stuff out, and it's all a lie. On the other hand, the the subject of Venezuelans. Well, Guajira is a border region, just like Cesar and the Norte de Santander, Arauca. It's very difficult, and it's difficult to see how the national press are trying or have created a stereotype of Venezuelans which is they are aggressive and and they're coming to cause crime in Colombia knowing that uh, knowing what Colombia is Sadly, that's a generalized opinion of people towards Venezuelans, which is a very indifferent. Um, it's very little solidarity. So there's ki there's women with small children, m months or newborns who are months old or newborns who are sleeping in the street, and sadly, uh, the this is the arrival of Venezuelans into Guajira, and the institutions have their hands tied because they can't do much. In terms of health, the Guajira Department reported that in terms of attention, medical attention to Venezuelans in hospitals, approximately 9 million pesos have been spent in 2016, 2017, and 2018, 9 billion. 9 billion pesos. And on the other hand, the we're still warring. The health secretary is doing a serve or monitoring in terms of uh, about HIV and they're saying that with the with increase of and the entrance of Venezuelan sex workers, the pres the HIV rate has also gone up. 
this is complicating this. There is a very floating population in um, Guajira because of the boon that Ms. Socorro was talking about because she said she heard that there was a lot of money in Arauca, there was a lot of um, petroleum, a lot of oil. And so when people come to our territory, they realize that the, this question of there being a lot of money is not true. La Guajira is the second poorest department in Colombia. In 2017, in three years, 5,300 children have died from malnutrition or from illnesses related to malnutrition. This has a lot to do with the bad quality of water that we are drinking because children might be eating well, but if they have a poor drinking water, water that's not drinkable, it will cause or it does cause uh, diarrhea as well as other intestinal infections. That's our country. That's what Colombia is. Sadly, right now we see the statistics that show that not everyone has the same statistics about human rights defenders in Colombia, but I think I think the closest one to correct is in the past, where it's another or it's an organization that reports in around this time or in this, these two months in Colombia, they say that around thirty human rights defenders have been murdered in Colombia, according to uh, in the past February, February report. The last three human rights defenders who were murdered were from the Norte de Santander, one woman and two men. In, in Sorry, it was in Cauca. This is the landscape that we face as defenders. Um, these are all in terms of the special the special peace jurisdiction uh, and the the unit of dis searching for disappeared people it's in the initial initial phases right now they are looking in the, the the truth commission and the civil society with the netherlands embassy has been has been um, going around collecting in reports from the territory from civil society groups to uh, to know how the truth commission can operate how to get information because there has been a lot a lot has been spoken about this but nothing has been actually put down everything is kind of like just written on the peace accord saying that you, the the human rights defenders will be protected but it's not saying how actually it will happen so it's not just that they say it, but how they do it. And this is where we are stuck. In terms, we are worried that the Truth Commission does not serve the special jurisdiction, special peace jurisdiction. So, what is it for if it's not going to be, it's not going to include this, if it's not included in the special peace jurisdiction? The ethnic, the ethnic, the ethnic Nagreed, which was the last one that was added in, and it wasn't even a a point in the agreement, but rather a footnote, and we s are worried about the free, prior, and cons and consensual um, consultation in with territories. It's not a consultation about law, but it's more of a administrative process as if we were in their house and we were saying like hey we're here we're, we're going to give you a couple they're, they're, we're in their house and they're saying we're going to give you a couple of months to get out of, out of their house um, sadly this is a reality that we're facing in our territory and everyone's saying well Colombia it, it's really come together but I think each one of us have to contribute to the construction of peace and we have to continue weaving a path so that we can live a total and absolute peace and there is a very big and absolute challenge. Thank you.
Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Angelica, Angelica, especially for reminding us of the importance of making visible the most vulnerable victims who are many times Afro-Colombian and indigenous groups as well as women within those groups. So I think the example of your association is very inspiring for many of us and thank you for reminding us that in spite of this increase in violence that victims seek continue to support the peace process and that you see these contradictions and incongruencies between uh, on both sides regarding the, the peace and war and the issues that you highlighted regarding prior consultation and the ethnic chapter are very important and I'm sure we could discuss the experiences in the Guajira and prior consultation all day. We have 30 more minutes. I don't want to leave us with too little time for questions and for Lisa and Jimena's presentation. So I'd like to present our last winner, Ivan Madero Vergel, Vergel, pardon me, winner from the category of the experience, the collective process of the ill. He's part of the Regional Corporation for the Defense of, Defense of Human Rights, Credos. Members, may, their membership is made up of civil society members in the Magdaleno Media region, founded in 1987. The corporation defends human rights, democracy, international humanitarian law. It works with grassroots organizations and social movements so they strengthen peace and raise awareness of human rights violations. In the past two years, Credos has boosted peace pedagogy so that locals better understand the contents of the peace agreements so they can monitor and advocate for its implementation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. Good morning to everyone. I would like to thank Dia Diakonia, the Church of Sweden, for this great opportunity that you are offering to human rights defense organizations and the defenders and to defenders of our territories. It's a great opportunity to have such an important and fundamental prize as is the National Prize for the Defense of Human Rights. So I've been a representative for Credos for the past five years. We have won in this category of non-governmental experiences uh, of human rights in the territory. It has been an important prize that represents the 30 years of work done by Credos in the Magdalena Medio region, especially in its epicenter, Barranca Bermeja. I would also like to recognize and thank WOLA for this great opportunity and the Institute of Peace for hosting us this morning here and to all of you for listening to us and for being interested in the situation of human rights in our country. Credos represents a whole life of defending and promoting human rights in the Magdalena Medio region. It's an organization comprised of men and women who are convinced that the defense of human rights is an important and inherent ingredient to the construction of peace. We can't talk about peace without talking about human rights. It, their defense, their promotion and protection is important. A human rights defender in the region is a person who is convinced that we can't do this alone. We can't get ahead 
alone. We have to get together in different collective spaces to demand our rights. Rights that could generate spaces for social well-being. It's an altruistic activity. It's a resistance activity. And many of us dare to do that, to create these collectives and organizations so that we can be the voices of our communities. That's why so many people are angry. They feel impotent because of this great voice that we use to make public complaints. They see us as an obstacle or, 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 or a bother for their individual plans. It's been 30 years of credos, of having human rights defenders be assassinated, displaced, and uh, persecuted. Uh, for example, David Crespo, he was persecuted by the judicial system. He was held in prison for seven years for a false case that was brought against him. And that was one of three -ish, uh, instances of judicial persecution of our members. We still have members in exile. We have a representative, Ferias, who continues to live outside of the country. They left in 1998. Uh, corralled almost by paramilitaries. They could no longer withstand the persecution uh, done by intelligence organizations. Another... Some of us who have left for a long time have come back convinced that this is the time for peace. And while they want to uh, make this difficult, we've come back for that, to continue demanding human rights and to build uh, the peace that we've dreamed so much of. And so we're excited to come back because Osiris, who lives on Isla Margarita in Venezuela, is dreaming and is excited to come back to Branca Bermeja at some moment. My colleagues here have spoken in detail, so I'm going to not do that so much, but I would like to state some important considerations. I would like to quickly review some of the things that my colleagues here have said. First, the issue of guarantees. and protection, not just for human rights social leaders. This transitional period that Colombia is living through is contradictory because today we are orphans, we feel alone and lacking protection. The community in general in the regions in Colombia and Magdalena Medio is a special case. Human rights defenders were social leaders, peasants, unionists. And the ex combatants that are currently living through a reincorporation process. So these three sectors includes the entire population of Colombia which is lacking protection. This process is contradictory. This peace process is contradictory. It doesn't fit within this narrative of peace because there have been some excellent, great agreements reached between the government and the FARC and there have been uh, there's been a dialogue initiated in Quito that's very important, but today the lack of guarantees for the defense of human rights and the lack of guarantees of human rights for communities is in danger.
This affects the issue of implementation as well. In 2015, in Credos, in, in January of 2015, during a planning session for that year, we agreed we were going to work on two points in, uh, in the agreement. One was political participation because we realized that there's a lot, there's not very much included in the agreement for the urban areas. So we wanted to see how we could take advantage of the agreements as a way to solve our social problematic. But Credos also made an effort to work on the fifth point, which is the Integral Commission for Truth uh, non-repetition, because we think that victims are important, and that's what we saw in the agreement. They were the central piece of the agreements. But today the reality in the regions is different. Today we must work for all of the points agreed upon, and that's how we have understood it over the past two years. But we're worried about the system. We were hopeful and we thought that victims would play an active political role so that they could, they could recur to the special uh, jurisdiction for peace, but it hasn't been that way. We've seen how that fifth point has been torn apart. Today, we are stigmatized as human rights defenders. They say, you can't be here. But within the special jurisdiction of peace structure, we still are not able to understand or see what the victim's participation will be. It's not clear at what time victims can begin to participate. Also, We also, with this exclusion, see what's going on with point number two, which is also having to do with victims participating politically. And there were different special spaces created through the agreements. Today, we don't... It's a big mess, as we say down there. Today, it's not clear whether or not they will be approved. Also, regarding point number three, when we talk about guarantees, we talk about armed actors. It's inevitable. And in Colombia, we were sold the idea as well as in the international community, that paramilitaries have disappeared. It was Uribe's great achievement. <laughs> they focused on other strategies. There's a new phase of paramilitarism in Colombia, imposing their terror and control over the regions, both in the rural areas and in the cities. They are taking and disputing these territories. And that's how we see the necessity of point three of the government complying w with its promise to dismantle paramilitarism. But not just to dismantle it militarily, but also to dismantle it economically, politically, and socially. And then we look again at the special jurisdiction for peace. We see civilians and others who have been declared guilty, and then they come and enter the armed conflict, financing and, financing and supporting paramilitary groups. So these are our worries in terms of victim participation and guarantees. 
And point number four has to do with crop substitution, the substitution of illicit crops. We can't have a double morality, and the government does. When a voluntary substitution is approved, and I don't have the figures in front of me, but there are many, many peasants who have grown coca who have agreed uh, with this uh, proposal in the regions. 123,000 families, according to our friend Enrique here, who have registered and signed and affirmed that they will not plant coca again. So what is Santos's government giving them? A forced eradication, stigmatization and judicial persecution of peasants, uh, tying them to drug trafficking. That's a big worry because it generates, generates distrust vis-a-vis -vis the agreements. Several months ago, a week after the unfortunate uh, incidents in Tumaco and the massacre carried out by the police and army there regarding forced eradication, we were accompanying some peasants from some hamlets of the south of Bolivar, uh, of the Bolivar Department, whose coca crops were also being forcibly eradicated. And they said to us, how is the government going to come present some agreement to us and then they're going to yank out the coca plants forcibly? What's going to happen to us? And it can't be that first they, they substitute and then they get the subsidy and then there's the project. It all has to happen in a parallel manner because that's how the peasants earn their living. The campesinos live that, off of that. And Colombia invests in highways to ben which benefit all transportation companies. The main highways and roads, but the roads leading to small hamlets and villages don't receive any investment, not one peso. And that's why the campesino or peasant decided to plant coca in the first place, because yuca and plantains were not profitable. Because then the intermediaries would then raffle it off in every town and port. It's important to reflect on this on the substitution of illicit crops because it's an international problem. This, uh, just some observations in terms of the agreements, in terms of the social crisis, because there's also a relationship between a lack of knowledge of different rights, environmental, political, social, I'm referring to my region. Today, in the Magdalena Medio region, We are living through a very precarious social situation where people are drowning in poverty. Barranca Bermeja is a port mainly for petroleum. It has a multimodal port and is surrounded by six or seven mega projects. There's a 40% unemployment rate there. There's an approximate 25% rate of absolute poverty. Today, the workers who fight to maintain their jobs, not for any sort of wage increase, simply to maintain their jobs, such as the workers in fertilizer in Colombia, the only public company in Colombia that produces organic uh, fertilizer and is important to the process, hasn't received its employees haven't received their salaries in 10 months. 50 employees have been laid off. Also talking about palm workers who are hired by intermediaries. I'm going to wrap up soon. By third parties, intermediary companies that don't recognize the stability of, uh, of employment and leave the family, the worker and their families in precarious situations. Economically, approximately a thousand workers f 
for third parties from Indupalma in Bolivar are outsourced. And they're demanding that the government eliminate cooperatives. And that will result in extreme poverty. It's a form of slavery that is being experienced. In addition to all of the corruption today, Barranca Bermeja is an orphan. The mayor has been placed behind bars along with 10 other public officials. That means that today there's social humanitarian chaos in the Magdalena Medio region. Its capital, Barranca Bermeja, is facing a humanitarian crisis. And just to conclude, I would like to say that peace is built in the midst of war. The armed conflict is currently in force, still. And we have to make the Colombian government commit itself to sit down with the ELN guerrillas again and, the, and to dismantle paramilitaries because otherwise we can't have peace. The Colombian people are facing a situation of uncertainty. And we said this yesterday at a meeting at WOLA. We don't know if we should talk about peace or the armed conflict. You can't build the peace in the midst of a war. We have to have an ideal situation for this transition and reconciliation and to build trust. But we must also say, and I'm sure that you can deliver the message to the United States government, that the embassy should have a commitment that's more territorial it has to decentralize its operations so that in terms of supporting peace in Colombia, they have to go to the different regions and learn firsthand and not just hear what the political class in Colombia has to say, that everything is in harmony because the FARC signed some agreement. But we also have to let the government know and the embassy, through the embassy that they have to guarantee the security of these ex-FARC combatants so that they may participate calmly in this electoral cycle. We can't have an electoral cycle where people are killed and stigmatized uh, because of the party they belong to. We don't want to return to what we had with the Patriotic Union. It was, there was an extermination, a genocide that the Colombian government has not yet responded to. It hasn't responded to any uh, communications from the Inter-American Human Rights Commission regarding this genocide. I would also like to say that we human rights defenders are remain committed but everything must be done in terms of solidarity and accompaniment with the international community. You are key for the defense and protection and promotion of our rights, but you're a key for achieving peace in our territory. That's why I invite you to come to all of the regions that we've named, to the Magdalena Medio, to Buenaventura, to Arauca, to La Guajira, because there you will, we are really permanently continuing there and we're continuing to fight so that the government offers us an opportunity of social well-being. I want to ask for a round of applause for all the human rights defenders. Okay, thank you so much, Ivan, for your, your very important perspectives from the Magdalena Media region that you said was one of the most affected regions um, and the work of Credos has been fundamental for the protection of communities in that region. I want to quickly uh, offer the space to Jimena and Lisa to give a few comments so that we can sort of wrap up this morning's event. Jimena, if you want to. Good morning. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank the U.S. Institutes for Peace and Diaconia and the S Swedish Church 
for this opportunity, but also for this marvelous award that they give each year, which is so important in Colombia. And I'm very honored to be a part of this effort, which is really a legacy of Jamie Bouvier, a person who, is very, who would be very happy with what we're, that we're doing this today. I have a few quick comments, and then I have like 10 points that I think that we can do here in the United States to support based on what our colleagues here have said today. Okay, first, Colombia has gone through some enormous changes in the last 16 months, transformative changes, which we, we really have to, must celebrate them. We know that after the displacement of 6 million people, and more than 220,000 people murdered, more than 70,000 disappeared, and thousands of kidnapped people, and the quick acceleration of cultural extinction of hundreds of indigenous groups and um, attacks against the um, palanqueros and other communities. Finally, a peace agreement was signed. This is something that we must celebrate and that we must support. At the same time, you cannot forget the fact that there are some problems and we have to see how these problems can be corrected so we do not repeat this time period for Colombia. And also remember that here in the United States, must the United States must think about and accept the responsibility that it has um, in the conflict in Colombia, which I would say is like the third part of this conflict, the elephant that's not there, but it actually is there in the room, especially for all this, because of all the military support it's given and the pressure that it's put uh, on anti-drug laws, which have not been effective, um, and also not have only not been um, not effective but have been very harmful in many ways I also so I think that we must listen to these people who are here these people who really are the future of Colombia they've always been the future of Colombia but now I think they have the opportunity to really do what they want to do which is build democracy and to find nonviolent ways to heal the conflict. The, they bring with them very unique experiences of self-protection which really are not seen in other parts of the world based on international humanita humanitarian law. And there are, they are examples of resistance, of people displaced, of victims, of people who are in a situation who have been affected by all sides and are looking for self-protection to be able to live normally in the middle of a conflict. There are also examples of the plural um, ethnic, political, and cultural diversity and the, diverse, the regional diversity that Colombia has, which is so important and which is its strength. But, as they said, there have been in these months a significant deterioration in terms of security and really frankly a lack of capacity of the government to look to find a resolution a quick and effective resolution to these situations so I'm not going to say it again but this is security um, the dearticulation of other illegal armed groups the integration the, of um, ethnic territorial spaces and also to seek a solution to illegal illicit crops which would be a sustainable way and which would be done jointly with the communities that are forced or obliged to live off of this because they don't have any other options. So what can we do here? Well, many things. First, more than anything else, we can insist that our Department of State, which is right next door, and the Senate guarantee that human rights conditions, human rights be conditioned on, or military support, support be conditioned on human rights. And the, part of that has to do with breaking the links between members of the armed forces and um, groups, whether they be called new, regrouped, paramilitaries, or BACRIM, whatever they call it, the fact is that they're there. 
The other thing is that we have a, a labor work plan between the United States and Colombia. This action plan has as its prime um, point, and this was done due to the pressure before the free trade was passed with the Congress between our Congress and Colombia, to uh, do out to do away with outsourcing. Outsourcing basically takes away labor rights and puts an end to unionization, and which is unionization. Um, and it has a very special focus in uh, the palm oil sector, in the port sector, where two of our guests come from, and in the mining sector, where the third person comes from. These are the areas where we must be putting pressure on because this is very problematic. The other thing is the ethnic chapter of the agreements. In this moment, it had to be basically beat into the accords, but it happened, and it, but it's something that must be respected and it must be strengthened from the international community. We must prioritize the integration of ethnic rights, especially the previous consultation of, in the implementation, especially with the special uh, jurisdictions for peace. The very accord talks about respecting the Cimarron communities and the self-protection methods that these communities have used for years and during all the different conflicts with different governments and with the different armed actors and in in their many manifestations in Colombia. Uh, we, and we also must guarantee that um, what our president said should be rejected. This idea of um, rejecting economic aid and diplomacy and supporting human rights, all those things that the USAID is doing in Colombia, yes, it must get better, and there are things that are still lacking, but they are there to consolidate peace. We cannot solve this problem militarily. We cannot go back to what we did before, which was a big, big mistake, and now we have come to the point where we can find a different path. And the other thing is the fourth part of the agreement on drugs. You must allow it to work. But to allow it to work does not mean just giving it time. It has to be done well. So the c international community must see how what can be done to take off the uh, obstacles so that this, agree this accord um, effectively goes into effect and so that it really happens efficiently. I just have three more. One is we must uh, s support the re-starting re, uh, of dialogues with the ELN. It has been the, it has been a scar in the nation. Another scar. The stopping has been a s scar in another nation that doesn't need it. And we must also talk about elevate the situation of human rights defenders and of other people who are trying to reincorporate into society. It is absolutely necessary to uh, make sure that this uh, crisis is known in the world. And finally, we must support the pro supporting the peace process. Must means like it's very good what Colombia has done with the peace process, and it's not to diminish what they've done by talking about the problems and looking about solutions. It's about saying, like, listen, we're allies, we're friends, and and we're, you were saying this for your good. And so this is what we must be saying from the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimena. And now we're going to hear from Lisa for a few of her comments. This award celebrates the great diversity strength, creativity, and the creativity of the human rights defender community in Colombia. We see a tremendous energy and persistence, diverse ways of organizing. You have seen today an emphasis on the work in network and the work of organizing communities and the processes and uh, accompanying community processes. There are really inspiring examples like such as creating humanitarian spaces. There's different names for that, 
but spaces where people with within the very conflict are creating out of their own efforts out of their own volunteer time peaceful efforts and telling the armed actors that no you can't do your stuff here you must understand that we do not want to be part of the conflict just like Martin Luther King or Gandhi it's very important you've also seen the sense of humor and the emotion that the human rights defenders bring from Colombia so all this is part of our work as as um, supporters and to support the tremendous work that human rights defenders do in Colombia there's a part of this uh, evaluation as jury that we that we have to do and I never want to do it again I want this to disappear and that is that we have to uh, take into account the risk that each human rights defender uh, runs I want to take that out of the list but we can't unfortunately and we need to continue focusing on the risk that they are running and that they should not be running I uh, the awardees have explained today and also Jimena mentioned many ways in which we really can defend the work of human rights defenders in Colombia I'm going to mention three quickly the question of the dis the articulation of paramilitary and neo paramilitary groups and groups and the people who have financed them the real importance of advancing in the implementation of the peace process and so that it, it is not in limbo also the importance of always investigating and processing uh, the threats and attacks against human rights defenders I think that the Colombian government the international community and all of us here have a lot of challenges yet to really be able to protect the people who are creating within their territories peace the peace that we all dream of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa and Jimena, for your comments and for these recommendations for all of us here in the United States and those of us who are interested and in solidarity with Colombia. We, it always happens to us that we go over time, but whoever wants to stay, maybe we have a time for maybe two questions from the audience. I'm going to allow Tony to choose since she has the microphone. Good morning. My name is Nubia Garcia, Nuria Garcia. And I. You all repeated that they have to continue and you have to do an effort to recontinue the process with the ELN. But however, historically, the peace processes have failed, not just in the country, but around the world. With and among many other factors is the lack of political will by one of the fa by one of the parties. I personally feel that the ELN does not have political will to really go to the peace process. That's what happened with the FARC in, in the seven other peace pro in processes that happened. The majority of them did not have political will. It was basically a, a game and one strategy to f for in their struggle that they had. So I honestly think that we have to do a peace process with all armed groups that are in the country and that the dialogue is the way to do this to end the conflict in the country but how can we do to implement it and to continue the negotiations when there really is no true will from one from one of the parties 
Thank you very much. We'll take one question. I'm Beatriz Ordus. Firstly, I thank you for being here. You are a reason f um, for pride for many people like myself. It gives me a lot of satisfaction to see you here. When Enrique mentioned the 70,000 victims, it reminded me of the 32,000 soldiers and the 40,000 police killed in this armed conflict. I think it's also 32,000 mothers, many orphan children. And my question, when we talk about the social, environmental, and gender justice, maybe Ms. Socorro might imagine, what does it mean more to have more than a thousand abortions um, imposed on young girls and women who are who were recruited f forcefully by the FARC. <laughs> Women, girls stolen from their peasant f f partner. We're talking about a, talking about at least five human rights. Thank you very much. One last <clears throat> brief comment. Thank you for being here and talking with us. I wanted to ask you where you see a space for adolescents to take part in this process. Who would like to respond? Ivan? It's a reality. Uh, after such important agreements reached in Havana and signed at the Colon Theater, political, the political wills of the armed actors have to overcome. I think that the Colombian government has a serious commitment to end the armed conflict. And today it's a great need. and a responsibility for the Colombian government to lay the foundations for this uh, rapprochement with the ELN. We can't have this discourse that we have to wait for the other one to be willing. We shouldn't open the door or the window. If we don't leave the door open to these agreements in Quito, it's a step backwards. That's why more than wills, I think we need to talk about needs, because this is a process that's and this is a process that that we must demand this willingness from armed groups, respect international humanitarian law, respect to law and to, and to the property of civilians. But it is up to the state, up to the government, to lay the foundations which are secure in order to build peace in the territories, in this case in Colombia. That's why from the regions we are insisting and calling upon the government to re-initiate the dialogue in Quito. But we're also saying to the ELN, and we told this to the ELN in Barranca Bermeja, that this wasn't the time for uh, armed lockdown, of demonstrating their force. Because this is a different time now. This is a different moment. But we also have to recognize that the armed conflict has certain dynamics, which must be understood so that we can show the Colombian government that the war continues in our country? Just to answer the first question. Uh, let's talk about the role of adolescents. But I think we can't justify the continuation of violence Maybe 
our analysis will lead us to believe that the ELN does not want a peace agreement, but but I think we also have to have some guarantees on the table. I'm not justifying the ELN. But I'm also worried about the 50 ex-FARC combatants that have been assassinated. But that's, some, that's something else. But regarding the issues of mothers, of victims, yes, there have been victims among peasants. But we have to remember that the armed forces have victimized our communities by means of false positives, for example, who have abused and raped girls. The case in Arauca was tremendous. There was a girl abused and raped by an, an officer. He raped and murdered a girl and then killed her siblings. So we know that there have been victims of the FARC and the armed conflict. We know that we're not going to give one another kisses in a war. It's two different bands disputing power. So yes, unfortunately, this practice of abortion within the armed groups, we see that. And we also see recruitment. But the army has also recruited folks who are children and, and from indigenous communities. But that doesn't justify that young people be involved in the war. And something we mentioned during the crafting of the peace agreement, there's no justification for a child who was recruited any group, be it an illegal or legal group, because we have to remember that before the armed forces would recruit minors, until that was regulated in Colombia. We were saying that we don't think it's fair for a child who was recruited at 8, 9, 12 years old. We don't think that after 18, they should be judged as someone who voluntarily joined the ranks of this group. And also the issue of young people. The young people were the sector of society that clamored most for these agreements with the FARC. They were the ones in the Plaza Bolivar demanding an agreement now, agreement now. So I think that the role of young people, maybe it's not mentioned like this, but the peace agreement includes the issue of youth people. It's not uh, an intersectorial part of it, but it's included. But I think it's fundamental to build peace hand in hand with young people because they're the next generation. They're the ones that are going to be holding all of these different uh, offices and playing the roles that are being played now by us, Beatriz. Of course, of course, the issue of that birth that we were talking about is something new. It's so that we can overcome a great tragedy that thousands and thousands of us victims have lived through. That's why the issue of truth In this case, the issue of being a human rights defender doesn't let us define who are the victims of the state. We all we celebrate that point five left as a fundamental pillar, the complete clarification of truth. And right now, unfortunately, it seems that the only ones who are going to pass through this system are the FARC. All of the other sectors that have to respond for their participation in the conflict 
have been left out due to budget cuts and things that have happened in the in Congress. So we have to know what the whole truth is. That is a right that all Colombians have so that we can build peace upon those foundations and we have to know the truth about what happened with the situation of uh, uh, members of the armed forces and the police and children. And there's a lot of speculation. We're also currently uh, in the middle of a media war. It's not just necessarily, but I would like to wait to respond to that question until I see what the Truth Commission has to offer so that we can know deep down that right to truth and I would like to highlight this fundamental step that we've taken that we were able to achieve with the FARC. It was less because of the government's will and more because of the demands of the public that this process happened. Even though we didn't achieve more, we think that it's a fundamental step towards the construction of peace. However, that's the way to resolve the armed conflict. The challenge of peace is to resolve the structural causes that led to the conflict. And those are still uh, current. So the proposals that we've made here uh, have to do with that. We want to build a culture of human rights so that this can be a reality in the world. Yeah. With regard to what the lady has said in terms of the abortions, of so many children who lack protection and, and children who have died. I have a concrete case. Many young women, when they become pregnant, want to get rid of their kids because they want to remain uh, single. And I had a case with a young lady and as we say, we saw her. We saw that she was going to drink a certain remedy with two pills of Aralen, which is a malaria medication. You know that I am a midwife. And it there, and I, I, I committed myself to raising the baby. I told her, I'm willing to raise the baby. I have the baby. The baby's 18 years old. The baby is now studying and in 10th grade, thanks to God. And I thank God first and the prize because it has opened doors for me to go and speak with members of the Office of the Human Rights Ombudsman. I spoke with them in Cali. And there was a secretary there. I think her name was Elizabeth. But... She said that from behind these desks, we don't know what goes on in the regions. So you all who are there, why don't you help us to convince and organize all of the children and adolescents and the elderly? Why? Because we, the elderly, have experiences. And adolescents... just want to hear about I'm giving you 400,000 pesos and you're going to learn how to shoot a gun. And so the young kids don't know what to do because many times their mother is working or is busy with other things and they don't they don't even teach them how to write from 1 to 5 or 5 to 10. So that's a chapter that I would like to open in my area in my jurisdiction, which is Flor Amarillo, from the Tame municipality. I have the land. Now I just need help with the construction materials because I have 80 adults over the age of 60. I have 56, 55 adolescents between 12 and 17. 
and I have 47 children between the ages of 5 and 9. But we need the Office of the Human Rights Ombudsman or someone to help us, even if it's just with the cinder blocks. We have the human resources to work. Because thanks to God, I can hold a meeting and I know that the men and women will help me. And once we have the materials to build this house, and we can organize amongst ourselves. So that's what I am asking for. We are the ones that educate the children so that someone else doesn't come to take them away and, and to affect our girls. Because I have a question for you. What if I was a 14 or 17 year old girl and I came to ask you for a job and uh, you asked me, do you know how to sweep? And I said, no. And you asked, do you know how to make coffee? And I said, no. And you asked, do you know how to cook plantains? And I said, no. What has been my education? Why is it like that? Because many times our mothers don't worry about us. And if we go to school, they won't teach us all that. But if we have a home where we have the elders and the adolescents and the children, between all of us, we can build a community and we can create peace there. Because that's what we're going to learn, is how to create peace, an educated community that can get ahead, where we can learn how to do many things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Socorro, Enrique, and Helica, and Ivan. Thank you for your responses. I want to thank all of you in the public um, for waiting here until 12.30 today. Thank you for your interest, and hopefully that you continue uh, f being with us in future fora uh, around peace in Colombia. I want to especially thank Maria Antonia Donis. Uh, my colleague here for all of her um, efforts to make this event possible to for her collaboration with Jimena and Lisa and her their colleagues and obviously one one more final applause for our awardees and our winners of the national award Thank you very much and have a good day. Hopefully you leave inspired by these examples.